Coming up on Inside Lehman, working toward a new generation of medicine by rebuilding instead of just repairing. We'll introduce you to cutting edge stem cell research. We'll tell you about the people who are making it their business to know why it hurts and how to make it stop. That's the busy world of the nurse practitioner. An international human rights summit focuses its efforts on ending a cycle of violence against women. Plus, an onstage flashback to 1960s pop culture and the whirlwind battle for civil rights that came along with it. So sit back and relax because Inside Lehman starts now. Hello and welcome to Inside Lehman. I'm Maurice Mercado. And I'm Laura Boden. Researchers say a new generation of medical treatment is in our immediate future, and it involves stem cells. Inside Lehman's Dominic Gregory tells us more about how stem cell research, specifically in our treatment of eye disease, may change the way we see. Imagine a person diagnosed with a degenerative disease. Years ago, the prognosis would look dire, but recent medical developments show that there might be hope. One day, it could be as simple as injecting stem cells to repair what is currently a case of irreversible and continuing damage. The research is ongoing. Jason Mighty is one of several Lehman College students studying the migration and communication patterns of retinal stem cells. The focus of the research is on eye repair. The overall goal of our lab is try to create photoreceptors in actual dishes. We're trying to create cells to can be injected into retina and then differentiate and can be used to repair retinal tissue and you know. Photoreceptors are a vital part of the eye. Located in the retina and commonly known as the rods and cones of the eye, photoreceptors take the image received by the eye and translate it into nerve impulses that are interpreted by the brain. When the photoreceptors are damaged, vision is adversely affected. To actually understand the work being done in this lab, you have to first understand what a stem cell is and what could possibly be done with it. Stem cells are cells that have not yet been programmed for a final adult fate. So genetically and physically they're immature and they have what you call plasticity, meaning they can become almost any cell type in the body if they're isolated at an early age. What we can do with stem cells is we can guide them toward the appropriate fate, meaning we can, we can direct them with um, exogenous factors to become different types of tissues in the body that need repair. Certain chemicals that would normally be found in the body are applied to stem cells that are developed in a petri dish. This allows the results to be studied. Each student's research has a different focus, contributing to the overall mission of understanding how stem cells communicate. My experiment is just one part of a bigger thing, which is the big tissue retinal engineering here that we do at Lehman College. But my specific project is just to observe the cell cycle at, um, entry of neurons and um, just observe really what happens at different stages of cell cycle division using different chemicals to stain um, proteins and see what they look like. I need to look at the molecular content of my cells to see what is going on inside the cells. And once I figure out what is going on inside the cell, I can figure out, so how about if I put these two cells close together, then are they going to communicate and send a signal and talk to each other or not? The research being done here will no doubt contribute to the field of stem cell therapy, a field which is only in the beginning stages, especially here in America. Just recently, the FDA approved a phase one clinical trial for using stem cells to treat spinal cord injuries, but doctors are already seeing the potential for using stem cells to treat eye injuries. I think that stem cells for retinal diseases really have tremendous applications. I think that um, by and large, the diseases uh, which will need to be treated with stem cells are these diseases in which the cells die or degenerate. Dr. Lucien Del Priore, a retinal eye specialist at the Harkness Eye Institute says that stem cell therapy will not replace traditional forms of surgery, but rather help where surgery is currently ineffective. Usually it's a genetic defect, 
that the patient carries that they were born with that essentially leads to death of cells at a certain point during life. And at the moment, the techniques for stopping that cell death are, are you know, extremely limited, and most patients continue to lose vision despite our best efforts. The students on Dr. Redenti's team recognize the contributions they are currently making and have high hopes for their research. The tissue engineering aspect is really cool, but it would be a lot cooler to see that being applied into like your grandparents who are suffering from glaucoma or immaculate degeneration or soldiers coming back from the war and they have shrapnel in their eyes and if we can have this technology ready to go in maybe 15 or 20 years and to be able to restore sight to people, that's, that's an impact, that's something worth seeing. Similar to the calculator, which could be seen as the precursor to modern computers, stem cell research could very well be the precursor to something much grander and with a wide impact on medicine. But not all roads lead to victory, and medical research does indeed take a lot of discipline, patience, and exploration. Dominic Gregory, Inside Lehman. When you need medical care, you may find that the personal touch of a health professional that actually knows you and your health history can make all the difference. Inside Lehman's Jamie Blair introduces us to the world of the nurse practitioner. Nurse practitioners provide the modern day house call, the community health care that is now within reach and readily available in times of need. They bring the relationship back to a time when doctors and patients had a much closer one-to-one -one bond. In the busy healthcare system, doctors spend less and less time with each patient, and the nurse practitioner's job is vital to the health care of each patient. <laughs> Students are preparing to provide medical coverage with a community focus as they work on completing their degrees in the Master of Family Nurse Practitioner program at Lehman College. The approach to addressing medical problems is a holistic rather than reactive technique. They examine how the body functions, but see causes instead of just examining symptoms. When you think about a person, a person is not an arm or a leg or a headache. A person is somebody that lives in the community, has problems or has issues at home, issues, developmental issues, uh, you know, according to the age or stage that they are in their lives. So what we do is we look at the whole system of the person and from there we, we give care according to their necessities. That means learning to identify and read the many subtle indicators that are presented by the patient's symptoms and behavior. Human patient simulators prove to be valuable training tools since these devices can mimic many of the patterns of human respiration and typical patient responses to medical treatment. Students gain greater insight and hands-on experience prior to working in a clinical care setting. They get an interesting glimpse into their future, looking at a simulator that appears to be looking right back at them. The skills they acquire are in great demand, especially with the Bronx having some of the worst health indexes in the nation. We've got a, a ra rising uh, rate of diabetes of women uh, Hispanic, particularly Hispanic and African American women. We've got increasing obesity in, in, in children here in, um, in the Bronx. We've got asthma, which is one of the common health problems throughout the nation, but a very severe problem here in the Bronx. And depression, which is something that we don't talk a lot about. These students are developing their diagnostic skills in an advanced health assessment class. There is an added level of responsibility since a nurse practitioner has completed a master's degree or post-master's certificate level work. Open the jaw so you can feel the smoothness of it or you go from, from side to side, okay? And you'll be able to pick out like a weakness really. You really don't necessarily do this all the time unless there's a specific issue that you think is occurring with the facial nerve. The nurse practitioner can diagnose can medical conditions. The nurse practitioner can also prescribe medications where the RN cannot. Um, the nurse practitioner usually does a very good holistic assessment for the person, as well as so does the nurse. Um, nurses are pretty well known for their assessment skills. Residents will tend to overlook many things that the nurse practitioner will not overlook, and they are the ones who make the proper full assessment. I'm working in cardiothoracic ICU in Montefiore Medical Center. 
and I did my clinical rotation for my CNS um, in heart failure. I would like to pursue heart failure for my NP and thus serve that population. Once nurses have finished their master's level studies, as well as any additional training, they often apply their skills at various community medical facilities. One such place in which these additional skills are put into practice is the Mount Vernon Neighborhood Health Center. Located in the middle of a residential area, this center receives more than 200,000 patient visits per year for a wide range of medical specialties. The team also helps connect patients with other vital services. Many communities don't have the kind of services uh, that they need. Uh, very often uh, things like mental health services, dental services are really not uh, available to the families. And we're very fortunate here in certainly having a, a dental clinic and we're also very fortunate in having uh, social workers, uh, a child psychiatrist and uh, uh, many other professionals who work with uh, people with uh, mental health uh, problems. The doctors and the nurses work greatly with each other. Um, they, they meet my children's needs. They make me feel very comfortable. Um, and I can always come to them and ask them anything. When I began my pregnancy, they gave me great prenatal care. Um, they followed up with my daughter as soon as she was born. She's now seven, and she still continues to use the health center. And her doctor, Dr. Joy, loves her, and they just um, accommodate her very well, and so do they accommodate me as well. So, learning to be a nurse practitioner requires much more than medical knowledge. The profession demands that a person look at the big picture by being a good listener remembering that patients are people first, and then brainstorming a solution with colleagues may be the most effective way to provide the best care possible. Jamie Blair, Inside Lehman. Still ahead on Inside Lehman, fighting for those who don't have a voice. We'll take you inside the international effort to defend the rights of women. Plus, it's a tough world out there in the job market, We'll show you some of the latest strategies for finding a good job that's worth keeping. Travel the world. Learn new languages. Meet new people. Can you believe all this and more? It starts right here. At Lehman. Study abroad. Violence against women is clearly understood to be morally wrong and a criminal offense here and in many other countries around the world. But authorities sometimes turn a blind eye, even in the case of murder. Inside Lehman's Mercedes Ferguson tells us about an international effort to help end this cycle of violence in Central America. The Center for Human Rights and Peace Studies at Lehman College cites disturbing statistics. The combined murder rate for Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras is among the highest in the world. A significant number of the victims are women. In Guatemala, power structures that formed in the 1980s are believed to play a strong part in this. The center hosted New Pathways to Justice, an international conference examining ways to stop violence against women in Central America. It brought together victims advocates, human rights organizations, and forensic investigators. The state, the army, and the police trained their troops to sexually violate and torture women. And so you have a, a full range of people who are responsible for atrocities, crimes against humanity, genocide, and none of them have ever been brought to justice. And what's even worse is that the power structures that existed during the dictatorship, although there's a civilian government, those structures have never been dismantled. For the families of the victims, it has been a long road to finding justice. Jorge Velasquez Duran became a victim advocate after his daughter Clorina was raped and murdered in Guatemala. Speaking through a translator, Duran says when his daughter first disappeared, authorities told him she probably ran off with a boyfriend, and they did not even file a report. Por un lado me ayuda muchísimo. 
al principio de la presentación dice It helps me a lot yeah, to uh, personify her and uh, at the beginning of the presentation I said uh, he will be your voice, he will speak on your behalf and this is because um, the victims of femicide are dead and they cannot speak by themselves and they need to be heard so they need someone else to speak for them um, and uh, this is the only way to seek for justice. Teams of forensic investigators are also investigating other cases in Central America. One such investigation is focusing on a 2005 drug-related case in Guatemala, where a young lady was kidnapped and assassinated for being in the wrong place at the wrong time. American volunteers who helped to exhume her body say very little investigating was done. Any significant information that was recovered seems to have been ignored. There's a lack of political will to investigate these kind of deaths. In this particular case, this young girl, she was 17, had two strikes against her. Number one, she's female. Number two, she was a special needs kid. And people just aren't interested in anything that happens to females and special needs children. One of the many jobs for human rights organizations is to put human faces on cases of rights violations. There's a lot that needs to happen to take what's What's, what's on paper and make it real in women's lives. So a lot of that has to do with ensuring that uh, cases of violence are investigated properly, uh, that they're taken seriously by uh, prosecutors and, and pursued fully, and that um, you know, the justice system actually, actually responds. For students who attended the conference, it showed the path toward making a difference. And for some, it struck close to home. That has to be changed. I mean, we're in, a, in an era that we have the civil rights movement, we have the immigration movement that we're fighting for human rights and it's continues just, it's just continues to shock me. This isn't just about my country, it's about the whole world. And it's true, we live in a globalized environment, a globalized um, world where if it happens, if something shocking happens, it's like it's in the headlines. After a week, it's like, oh, it happened, oh well, like we can forget about it. It's definitely very important to educate children, um, even from very young ages, and to really have these programs constantly going on in school to, to let young teenagers know that this can happen. And it, it, it can happen to anybody or anyone. It doesn't matter what, it doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what race you are. It can just really happen to anybody. Conference panelists say the key to breaking the cycle of violence is to build the rule of law one case at a time, looking toward the day when the political and judicial systems will identify and prosecute those who commit violent crimes against women. Mercedes Ferguson, Inside Lehman. Working to find the career of your dreams after college can be both exciting and intimidating for many students, but it is never too early to start building the necessary framework for the future. Inside Lehman's Nicole Ashley tells us what students can do to get ready for life after graduation. College is a great learning environment for young people to expand their minds and also gain life experiences in the process. But after the four years are over and graduation time arrives, students often wonder, what happens next? And many times students, when they graduate, they have no idea what direction they want to go into. Nancy Centrone is the director of the Career Services Center at Lehman College. Although the current economic climate is not the best, she suggests that students prepare now for the road ahead by having a plan of action. This will make the transition from college to the working world go more smoothly. So it's important that you learn about the companies that you may want to work with or organizations if you want to go in the public sector or in the nonprofit sector. Learn as much as you can what types of opportunities there are and what those job opportunities entail. Some students don't necessarily know which field is best for them, but others are clearly focused on which career paths they should take. I really want to um, work in a hospital where I um, take care of patients and stuff, so maybe I'll become a physician assistant or a nurse. In order for students to find employment after college, many companies are requiring that students get hands-on experience by completing internships. But 
are the internships that students complete actually hands-on? Uh, personally, I think it's a very good uh, thing for, uh, for students to engage themselves in uh, internship because it helps them learn uh, new skills that they don't know already, and it helps them to be able to communicate with uh, other members of a team. Even though I haven't been there for too long, I've learned some new stuff that I already know. There will always be the occasion when a junior worker or an intern is asked to make coffee or sweep a floor, just like any um, junior employee in any corporation. However, we want to make sure that that doesn't happen all the time. Dr. Riss Rashalt, the internship coordinator of the Mathematics and Computer Science Department at Lehman College, says internship coordinators can establish business relationships between colleges and the companies that may eventually employ graduates. We have a special uh, cooperative program between our department and IBM, and that's an excellent program. We send our best programmers to IBM, and the people we've sent have had wonderful experiences, and more than half of them are still working at IBM years after they've finished. Internship opportunities are often a gateway to connections that can lead to employment, but internship responsibilities should be clearly stated. A noticeable trend of some companies bringing in so-called adult interns to work for free with the hope that actual employment may follow has caused federal regulators to take a closer look at whether the rules are clear enough. However, an internship that offers academic credit and is truly a learning experience allows students to network with people in the field. This separates them from the pile of faceless applications that businesses receive every day. It's right down the top. In Brooklyn. That's right, 180 Livingston Street. Demonstrating a track record of being involved in one's community is also attractive to employers. That is why involvement in campus activities carries weight when companies are looking for assertive, qualified leaders. Being part of a social club or being a member, be, ha, holding a position in student government helps so much because it basically makes the employer feel as if, wow, if the student was engaged in some sort of activity, then they must have developed that interpersonal skills that they're looking for. Making the transition from college to the working world will not be easy, but if you do your homework and plan now, you will have a fighting chance. Nicole Ashley, Inside Lehman. Coming up on Inside Lehman, lights, camera, bigotry, a look back on civil rights and the 1960s with a comedic take. All this and big hair too will take you to the stage of Hairspray. It began with a film about a teenage girl who just wanted to dance on television, but later found herself fighting generations of bigotry. Inside Lehman's Anne Andre takes us to the stage adaptation of Hairspray. Remember the days of big hair, polka dots, music, fun and laughter, and segregation? Then you must remember Hairspray. The year is 1962 in Baltimore, Maryland. The sound of rhythm and blues is in the air, and pleasantly plump teenager Tracy Turnblad wakes up with a dream to dance on the Corny Collins Show, a local TV dance program. But when she later wins a starring role on the show, she finds out that the program is racially segregated. Determined to right the injustices of racism, this overnight star immediately launches a campaign to integrate the show but finds that 1960s American society is not necessarily ready to embrace the cause. The first day of rehearsal, we didn't actually work on the show itself. I had given them a movement uh, assignment. I divided them up into groups and I asked them to research different aspects of the 60s. Um, segregation, the role of women in the culture, the Cold War, uh, pop culture. And, you know, I, one, of the, one of my cast members came up to me and she said, did you know that people had to use separate bathrooms in the South in the 60s? This production of Hairspray was challenging, as well as eye-opening for many of these performers, since there is such a gap between their present-day experiences and the lives of young people in the 1960s. 
I am 20 years old and the show takes place in the 60s, but really it's no matter what the time period, the era, the people, the stories are always the same. The faces are different, but we all come together for a unique experience. The story impacted me because I, it has to do with seg segregation and of course that's something that a lot of people take for granted nowadays and I think that it's still around at, uh, with the stuff that's going on in Egypt with uh, gay marriage, with anything that's going on. There's still segregation, whether it's about race, it could be about anything. Director Tim Cusack gets results by establishing a professional relationship with students and helping them understand their roles. The show has affected me in the in the light that it, because I am living, we live in the time now. You don't think about segregation. You don't think about the the, the dividing line between black and white. When I was um, in high school, it was an issue in our in Yonkers. We had to desegregate the schools. While revolution, segregation, and inequality are still issues in today's society, taking a deeper look at the problems of the past sometimes provides an opportunity to avoid repeating the mistakes. I like it that we learn something about the period, we learn something about the, the issues that are still with us, and um, the issues of racism are alive and kicking in the world uh, and in this country. Uh, uh, but people are dying all over the world because of racism. Come on, Emma! Let's get back to the right side of the tracks, if our cars are still there. What we, we talked a lot about how there's a lot of pressure to identify yourself. Like, okay, I'm white, I'm black, I'm Latin. And that anyone who doesn't want to categorize themselves in that way, it, it can cause a lot of discomfort in people around them. For some, this play touched a sensitive spot that we are all too familiar with, but it also offered a message of optimism. Sometimes we can break through the barriers of injustice in pursuit of love, joy, music, and dance. I see the beauty in everyone. It's just a matter of taking that step and, you know, taking that chance to risk, like how in the play it was about segregation and how we're trying to get everyone to integrate because black and white, you know, they can get along, they can be together, they can have fun. This rendition of Hairspray was packed with color, music, and dance a perfect balance and necessary ingredient to complete a healthy stew of freedom, fun, and liberation, free of unnecessary limitations. There's one more thing I have to say. The Courtney Collins Show is now and forever officially integrated! And Andre, Inside Lehman. And that's our show. But before we go, we want to thank our talented reporters and crew for all their hard work. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time for more news from Inside Lehman.